Hello everybody and welcome to today's reading through the Bible in 365. Today we are going to be reading Job chapter 8, 9, and 10 and Acts chapter 8 verses 26 to 40. Let's get started with Job chapter 8. Then Bildad the Shuite replied to Job, How long will you go on like this? You sound like a blustering wind. Does God twist justice? Does the Almighty twist what is right? Your children must have sinned against him, so their punishment was well deserved. But if you pray to God and seek the favor of the Almighty, and if you are pure and live with integrity, he will surely rise up and restore your happy home. And though you started with little, you will end with much. Just ask the previous generation. Pay attention to the experience of our ancestors, for we were born but yesterday and know nothing. Our days on earth are as fleeting as a shadow, but those who came before us will teach you. They will teach you the wisdom of old. Can papyrus, see, can papyrus reeds grow tall without a marsh? Can marsh grass flourish without water? While they are still flowering, not ready to be cut, they begin to wither more quickly than grass. The same happens to all who forget God. The hopes of the godless evaporate. Their confidence hangs by a thread. They are leaning on a spider's web. They cling to their home for security, but it won't last. They try to hold it tight, but it will not endure. The godless seem like a lush plant growing in the sunshine, its branches spreading across the garden. Its roots grow down through a pile of stones. It takes hold on a bed of rocks, but when it is uprooted, as it's as though it never existed. That's the end of its life, and others spring up from the earth to replace it. But look, God will not reject a person of integrity, nor will he lend a hand to the wicked. He will once again fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouts of joy. Those who hate you will be clothed with shame, and the home of the wicked will be destroyed. Chapter 9 then Job spoke again. Yes, I know all this is true in principle, but how can a person be declared innocent in God's sight? If someone wanted to take God to court, would it be possible to answer him even once in a thousand times? For God is so wise and so mighty. Who has ever challenged him successfully? Without warning, he moves the mountains, overturning them in his anger. He shakes the earth from its place, and its foundations tremble. If he commands it, the sun won't rise and the stars won't shine. He alone has spread out the heavens and marches on the waves of the sea. Sorry, I uh, didn't turn off my... Okay. He alone has spread out the heavens and marches on the waves of the sea. He made all the stars, the bear and Orion, the Pallades and the constellations of the southern sky. He does great things to mar too marvelous to understand. He performs countless miracles. Yet when he comes near, I cannot see him. When he moves by, I do not see him go. If he snatches someone in death, who can stop him? Who dares to ask, what are you doing? And God does not restrain his anger. Even the monsters of the sea are crushed beneath his feet. So who am I that I should try to answer God or even reason with him? Even if I were right, I would have no defense. I could only plead for mercy. And even if I summoned him and he responded, I'm not sure he would listen to me. For he attacks me with a storm and repeatedly wounds me without cause. He will not let me catch my breath, but fills me instead with bitter sorrows. If it's a question of strength, he's the strong one. If it's a matter of justice, who dares to summon him to court? Though I am innocent, my own mouth would pronounce me guilty. Though I am blameless, it would prove me wicked. I am innocent, but it makes no difference to me. I despise my life. Innocent or wicked, it is all the same to God. That's why I say he destroys both the blameless and the wicked. When a plague sweeps through, he laughs at the death of the innocent. The whole earth is in the hands of the wicked, and God blinds the eyes of the judges. 
If he's not the one who does it, who is? My life passes more swiftly than a runner. It flees away without a glimpse of happiness. It disappears like a swift papyrus boat, like an eagle swooping down on its prey. If I decided to forget my complaints, to put away my sad face and be cheerful, I would still dread all the pain, for I know you will not find me innocent, O oh God. Whatever happens, I will be found guilty. So what's the use of trying? Even if I were to wash myself with soap and clean my hands with lye, you would plunge me into a muddy ditch and my own filthy clothing would hate me. God is not a mortal like me, so I cannot argue with him or take him to trial. If only there were a mediator between us, someone who could bring us together. The mediator could make God stop beating me and I would no longer live in terror of his punishment. Then I could speak to him without fear, but I cannot do that in my own strength. Chapter 10 I am disgusted with my life. Let me complain freely. My bitter soul must complain. I will say to God, don't simply condemn me. Tell me the charge you are bringing against me. Sorry, mosquitoes. <laughs> uh, what do you gain by oppressing me? Why do you reject me, the work of your own hands, while smiling on the schemes of the wicked? Are your eyes like those of a human? Do you see things only as people see them? Is your lifetime only as long as ours? Is your life so short that you must quickly probe for my guilt and search for my sin? Although you know I am not guilty, no one can rescue me from your hands. You formed me with your hands. You made me, yet now you completely destroy me. Remember that you made me from dust. Will you turn me back to dust so soon? You guided my conception and formed me in the womb. You clothed me with skin and flesh, and you knit my bones and sinews together. You gave me life and showed me your unfailing love. My life was preserved by your care. Yet your real motive, your true intent, was to watch me. And if I sinned, you would not forgive my guilt. If I am guilty, too bad for me. And even if I'm innocent, I can't hold my head high, because I am filled with shame and misery. And if I hold my head high, you hunt me like a lion and display your awesome power against me. Again and again, you witness ag <clears throat> again and again, you witness against me. You pour out your growing anger on me and bring fresh armies against me. Why then did you deliver me from my mother's womb? Why didn't you let me die at birth? It would be as though I had never existed going directly from womb to the grave. I have only a few days left, so leave me alone that I may have a moment of comfort before I leave, never to return, for the land of darkness and utter gloom. It is a land as dark as midnight, a land of gloom and confusion, where even the light is dark as midnight. Moving on to Acts chapter 8, verses 26 to 40. As for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, Go south, down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and he met the treasurer of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under the Candake, under the Candake, the queen of Ethiopia. The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and he was now returning, seated in his carriage. He was reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, Go over and walk along beside the carriage. Philip ran over and heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. Philip asked, Do you understand what you are reading? The man replied, How can I unless someone instructs me? And he urged Philip to come up into the carriage and sit with him. The passage of scripture he had been reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, was the prophet talking about himself or someone else? So beginning with this same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. 
As they rode along, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? He ordered the carriage to stop, and they went down into the water, and Philip, uh, Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch never saw him, <clears throat> the eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Meanwhile, Philip found himself farther north at the town of Azotus. He preached the good. What is that? Hold on. All right, we're almost done. Meanwhile, Philip found himself farther north at the town of Azotus. He preached the good news there and in every town along the way until he came to Caesarea. All right, I don't know what that noise is in the background, but we're done. <laughs> Thank you for joining me for this reading through the Bible in 365. I hope you all have a wonderful day, and I will see you in the next one, guys.